Welcome to Future Proofing Vancouver. I'm James Raymond, the Senior Manager of Research at the Vancouver Economic Commission, known to our friends as the VC. For those who don't know, we're an independent agency of the City of Vancouver, and our purpose is to help build a prosperous, resilient, and zero carbon local economy for all. Thank you for taking the time to join us. I know we're on so many video calls these days, but we promise to make this discussion really engaging. So please feel free to put us on loudspeaker while you make your lunch or go for a stroll or use this time to catch up on some emails. As long as you listen in, that's great. I want to first acknowledge the land we are on today. While we are dialing in from all over, many of us are doing so from BC, almost all of which is unceded land. For me in Vancouver, that is the unceded Coast Salish territories, specifically of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I also want to recognize we have representatives from other First Nations on our panel today, notably from the Takla and Inkla Kapma nations. I also want to acknowledge this fact through our content and conversation today, which will dig into topics such as economic reconciliation and what that means for our future. So here's the agenda for today. We're going to start off by giving each panelist five minutes to speak without interruption or slides to tell us about the big changes they see coming to Vancouver and our province, things we need to think about and what we need to do to prepare us for these changes. There is a Q&A later. Please submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your browser, and our event team will sift through them and group them into ones we can ask later on. We don't have a chat function on today, but I encourage you to use the hashtag FutureProofVancouver if you'd like to talk about this event. Finally, please note we are recording this session just in case anyone leaves their cat filter on or leaves amusing objects in the background and we can make this video go viral. I think I'm okay here. So please, if you'd indulge me for a moment, let's take a deep breath and imagine that we're in the year 2075. How does Vancouver and BC look? Is your vision a dystopian Blade Runner type image where climate change has run amok? Is Vancouver a haven for climate refugees? Or are we already underwater? Is it instead a reforested utopia where the buildings are made of wood and it's hard to tell where the forest stops and the homes begin? Flying cars ferry people and goods around our land. Maybe we've built out into the sea. Are we born in test tubes and our lives determined by genetic sequencing? Or who can afford CRISPR? Does AI rule our lives? I know this sounds far away or even far-fetched. I've managed to reference quite a few science fiction films in that opening bit, but as we've seen in the last year, things can change very quickly. I don't know if any of you have seen the YouTube color video footage of Vancouver from 80 years ago, but if not, I recommend checking it out. It makes me wonder, what would the people in the, that video make of our city in BC today? Change is constantly underway and the rate of change gets faster by the day. We are already being confronted with enormous current and future challenges from the climate emergency to real and meaningful reconciliation to dismantling systemic inequality. We at the VEC are responding to these changes by pursuing economic transformation beyond this event. And today we are proud to officially launch the Economic Transformation Lab in partnership with SFU BD and MITEX. The Economic Transformation Lab, or ETL, is a program for research collaboration between industry and academia. What makes it different is that it focuses specifically on how to prepare Vancouver for some of the massive trends we see coming our way in the future, hence future-proofing Vancouver. It's our in-house think tank where we get to do some cutting edge research on topics such as affordability, the circular economy of food, moving beyond GDP, the impacts of 5G, childcare, remote working's impacts on our downtown core and the future of mobility. That's because we believe the choices we make now, the policies we generate and the ideas we embrace today are what steer us towards the version of future we want. So I invite you all to explore the program in more detail once the event is over. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the five experts joining us as panelists today with their own visions of the future. With us today, we have Regional Chief Terry TG from the BC Assembly of First Nations, Mayor Kennedy Stewart of the City of Vancouver, Mark Podlassey, an advisor to the BC Assembly of First Nations, Dr. Sarah Lupic from our ETL partners at SFU's BD School of Business, and J.R. Hammond from the Canadian Advanced Air Mobility Consortium. 
So it's my honor to introduce first Regional Chief Terry TG. Terry TG is a member of the Takla Nation and is the elected Regional Chief of the BC Assembly of First Nations, serving his second term. As Regional Chief, he was an instrumental voice in the development and historic passing of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. He brings many years of leadership and experience as a former registered professional forester responsible for looking after the forests, forest lands and forest resources. Terry is deeply involved in natural resource development. Chief TG, we're honoured to hear your thoughts on the topic of economic transformation, what that means to you in your context. Over to you. Masai, Nordis, Ni James, and, and thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction and in uh, my father's language, Daneza uh, Tekuza, Skies, my mother's language, the Gixon dialect, Samoyga, Tsumanana, Tsuma we get. Uh, just want to acknowledge all the speakers here today, all the guests, and, and all of you that are watching on, on this webinar. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge the territory that I'm calling from, the Claytley Tene territory, just in uh, outside of Prince George, uh, the community uh, unceded, unsurrendered, and continually occupied territory of the Dakar people here in Claytley Tene. I want to thank the um, Vancouver Economic uh, Commission uh, VEC panel um, and VEC itself, and, and also the SFU uh, uh, BD School of Business for this invite to to talk about uh, future proofing of Vancouver. So I, certainly now uh, we've definitely experienced the the issues with the economy uh, during this past year. Uh, we're going into uh, really the anniversary of, of living through this pandemic. And this pandemic de definitely had um, an impact on the economy, not only in the world, in Canada, in British Columbia, but also Vancouver as well, as we've seen uh, massive layoffs, uh, certainly a downturn in the economy. And it can be said that it has been de devastating to, to the economy. But I'd like to, to really put it in, in a different perspective that perhaps now is a time that, that it is really a reset. Over the last year, we've also seen the issues of uh, very chronic issues of the social inequities with our Indigenous peoples here in this country, in this province, and, and perhaps even in the city of Vancouver. So we're also living in a time uh, of reconciliation, an era of reconciliation, if you will. Over the last several years, we've been working on the declaration as law, and that was passed in November of 2019, which is known as the Declaration of Rights and Indigenous Peoples Act, DRIPA, if you will, Bill C-41 here in the province of BC. So really it's a time of change, it's an opportunity for our Indigenous peoples to be more involved in the economy. We certainly do have our views in terms of how uh, the economy does not include the most marginalized people in this country. The, and really the country that is Canada is a colonial country that has many policies entrenched with uh, racist attitudes towards Indigenous peoples. So in many respects, I see this as we come out of this pandemic, as we are trying to be more resilient, that many of these policies need to change. And so it's in this view that perhaps government, industry, and perhaps even general society needs to change in terms of their attitude towards Indigenous peoples. We certainly know that there are issues within the police force within healthcare and perhaps even the educational system of our of the views of indigenous peoples. So those views and, and those notions, uh, which can be very racist needs to change. And therefore we can be fully part participating in the economy. There are certainly opportunities now, as we see the declaration is law and perhaps even federal law where we are seeing uh, the proposal for Bill C-15 and even a proposal to the city of Vancouver from the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh that are proposing to have the, the city and council adopt 
the declaration as part of their laws, if you will. So on all levels, there certainly is a, a part to play in terms of changing the narrative and changing the really the relationship with Indigenous peoples, utilizing the declaration. The declaration itself is quite simple. It's a recognition of Indigenous peoples' human rights. In many respects, it's trying to level the playing field in terms of the recognition of Indigenous peoples, not only around the world, but here in Canada, British Columbia, and the city of Vancouver. So as we look forward to uh, the future, what I see in, in 2075 is a future that's much brighter, is a future that has Indigenous peoples as part of the decision-making process, is a more rich, not only for the economy of Indigenous peoples, but also for this country we call Canada, for this province we call British Columbia, and for this city we call Vancouver. So I'd like to leave you uh, with that uh, thought and, and also that the future is bright for Indigenous peoples so long as we live up to the articles and the intent of the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Thank you, Masicho. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chief TG, for those really powerful opening comments. And I hope we can all agree that this can't be a recovery and we just build back what we had before. I think there's hopefully an acknowledgement that we've got to transform and, and, and that's, that's, that's why we've used that word a lot today. Um, so with that, thank you so much. We're going to get into the declaration and what it actually means later on. But I'm now going to uh, pass over to Mark Podlassi, who's someone I know you've worked with a lot. Uh, so Mark Podlassi of the Inca Kapma Nation provides strategic advice at the intersection of Indigenous corporate governance and infrastructure issues. He has over 20 years of extensive experience in the development of capital projects connected to energy, natural resources and community infrastructure around the world. He also serves as Director of Economic Policy and Initiatives at the First Nations Major Projects Coalition. Mark wears many hats, but is today representing the BC Assembly of First Nations in his role as advisor to them. Now, Mark, over to you to talk more about economic transformation and your recent report on well-being, which we were so excited to read. Thank you, and I'm very pleased to be here. I am going to put a posting in the group to everybody right now about where the paper can be found that I'm going to talk about today. Excellent. So greetings. My name is Mark. My ancestral name is Datsha. I'm a member of the Cooks Ferry Indian Band at the Intlakapam First Nation in South Central British Columbia. I am a resident of Vancouver and I'm coming to you today from the Musqueam community in Vancouver. I want to bring us back to 2019, before the pandemic, and from an economic perspective of what the province was experiencing. At that time, British Columbia was the darling of the provincial economies across the country. We have, uh, our economy was valued at about $306 billion, which works out to about $60,000 per person. Our job growth, uh, or the growth of the province was expected the following year in 2020, 2020 was expected to be about 5%. And of all the provinces in the country, we were the only one who was expected to experience job growth. It was at that point that the BC Assembly of First Nations leadership and the leadership of other Indigenous organizations had a, a question was how much of all that growth that was going on was attributable to First Nations. Here we are, mostly in unceded territory across the province, the wealth of the province in resources and power uh, and uh, land base comes from our traditional territories and our territories across the province. So it was a reasonable question. So we looked into it and looked at the calculations that are used to calculate the size of the provincial economy. And the answer is zero. Because in this province, we use something called GDP, gross domestic product, to determine what the economy is or where it's going. And under GDP, GDP is a 1930s era, the Great Depression formula that was devised to measure national income. It was designed originally in the United States, but then exported to the world in 1944. And under that model, it is about production. It's a cash economy. If an item in the province cannot be calculated as cash, either in a production of an, an item or of a service, then it doesn't count. 
So the challenge for us as Indigenous people was looking at that going, well, surely we must have some value to the province somewhere. So we decided to look at this a bit broader to see, well, what are other jurisdictions doing? What are other Indigenous people doing in terms of planning out their economies? Because if you define an economy as, uh, or a good life as, an, as the economic model of a formula based in the 1930s, as was quoted at the time, anything you can drop on your foot and nothing else, then we are a very deprived and poor population because I would sense that indigenous values are shared by many people in Vancouver and British Columbia. If you define a good life as having safe families, uh, communities that uh, are resilient, education, uh, a knowledge of one's culture and history, an appreciation for wild uh, forests and places. What happened immediately after we began this project is COVID hit. And the good life as defined by a GDP and growing numbers of uh, uh, exports to the, prov for the province's coffers was turned upside down. In, in an instant, the values that we hold as indigenous people, which I just explained in terms of healthy environments, social, uh, socially connected families, the ability to have enough food to put on the table, the knowledge that your children and your elders will be safe from not only a virus, but uh, crime on streets, Good, good education, clean air, all became vitally important to everyone in the province. Because I doubt there's anyone in the province in the midst of COVID when we're locked at home in social isolation feels good that our gross domestic product is going to be growing at 4% per year when there's fear about, will I be able to get back to work? Will I have enough food? When's the next time I can see my parents? So what we did is that we developed a report and we looked at examples of places around the world. This is what's now in your uh, linked uh, page there. You can take a look. We went out as indigenous people in this province and reached out to other jurisdictions around the world to say, are you valued in your economy? And if so, how? And what was fascinating about the exercise when we went out is that we found that we were not alone as indigenous people in this province looking to wonder where our value comes in the economic planning process. We found 40 examples of economies around the world who were valuing the same things we do in this province in terms of uh, um, uh, healthy communities, healthy uh, education systems, environments, um, good work, sense of belonging into, into their nations. And these were not nations that you would uh, normally expect to be doing things like this. New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, Ecuador, they're all in our report and we highlight all the ways that these communities are starting to challenge the notion of what is a good life. So the question that was put to us, what's this world or what's Vancouver and the province of British Columbia look like in 2075, is that we would like people to start to recognize that the value systems that we find important in our lives are the same things that indigenous people here have uh, valued forever. There are also the values that the Vancouver Economic uh, Commission as well has started to outline in a lot of their work. And we would share this with everybody to have a good discussion about what does it mean to have a good life in this world that we are going to be building back from in, in the short, uh, in the short, well, very shortly with the uh, pandemic and recession. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, as many people know, probably on this call, moving us beyond GDP is a personal passion of mine, probably my life, life's work. And we'd love to work uh, with you uh, as, as you try and uh, move BC forward and, and so much to learn from, from your report. So I really encourage everyone to check it out, but not right now, straight after the event, please. Um, okay, so uh, thank you very much. And next up, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Sarah Lubin. So Sarah is a, an award-winning educator, entrepreneur, researcher, and entrepreneur. She's the executive director of the Charles Chang Institute for Entrepreneurship and SFU's first director of entrepreneurship. She has experience coordinating pan-European startup support programs focusing on key areas such as coaching, funding, and clusters. She's also a certified expert business coach and is the co-founder and marketing director of Lungfish Dive Systems, a high tech startup, and it's really, really cool what they do. So you should go and check them out, but also do that after the event. Sarah, I'm keen to hear your thoughts on the topic of the role of entrepreneurship in our economic transformation. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much, James. And 
I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we can get to that positive, sustainable future that you talked about. When I think about economic transformation and resilience, as SFU's Director of Entrepreneurship, absolutely nobody here is going to be surprised that I want to talk about the critical role of investing in entrepreneurial mindset. But what's likely to surprise you is that I'm not going to talk about starting businesses and I'm not going to talk about the latest technology. Um, in fact, looking at starting businesses and filing patents alone, similar to GDP, is not going to give you a very good picture of economic program uh, progress, health, or resilience. So what's far more powerful is the concept of entrepreneurial mindset. And that's the way that entrepreneurs think and engage in the world. And the core components of that are resilience and self-efficacy and opportunity recognition, which is around solving problems that matter and being able to identify places to make impact. And perhaps more importantly, and what I'm gonna talk about a lot today, imagination. When you have that mindset, you get companies, but, and you'll get very good companies that solve problems, by the way, but you'll also get scientists who can translate research into impact, employees who can adapt to shocks, and shocks are pretty much the only thing we can count on for the future right now, and citizens who can drive sustainable change in their communities. So imagination, which is tied up in systems thinking and future thinking, uh, is what I'd like to emphasize today because that's the ability to reimagine systems that are cracking and breaking. Um, and that's only gonna get more important. So there's a current tendency to either around entrepreneurship, move fast and break things without taking the time to imagine and plan for the repercussions of our actions, which is why we can make massive change and then suffer significant consequences because we weren't thinking past execution focus. Um, or we make incremental change or no change at all because we can't think of what a better system would look like. We can't imagine how to get there. And critically, we can't imagine how to create enough buy-in of our communities in order to get that longer term drive and that longer term change that will last beyond the term of a politician. So for example, right now in Canada, we invest really heavily in research and we are world leaders at that. And we invest really heavily in later stage incubation and support of growth stage companies. But we are missing a really significant continuum of activity that happens between those two things. And we are missing culture problems. We are missing training problems. We are missing capacity problems to absorb the kind of talent that we create in labs and universities. And all of these issues are not simple and they're interconnected. And there's still so much more to do. And this, this entrepreneurial mindset starts long before university. And so while we have systems that are cut up into chunks, we often don't realize and don't think about them as interconnected. And so things like we're a university, we're supposed to intervene when students get into university age. But one of the things we've done at the Chang Institute and SFU BD is to look at the part of the system before us and think, well, we think entrepreneurship is important, but universities don't give credit for entrepreneurship. And in fact, when students are preparing for university, they choose the courses that will give them university credit. And yet entrepreneurship until very recently wasn't one of those courses. And so we wanted that mindset, but we also disincentivized anyone from going to get it. And so BD and the Chang Institute partnered with a program called Yale and became the first university to give high school credit for our university credit for a high school entrepreneurship program. And so these are, these are cool things that we can do, but we need that kind of, how do we reinvent the system? How do we look at where those points are um, that will take us through to something new and exciting and being able to imagine that better future. So the point at the end of the day is to, to get that systems change we need to avoid that dystopian future that we talked about. We really need to think about investing in people and human capability and people who have that mindset, who can make that system change and then reimagining our systems to actually achieve the outcomes that we want. Fantastic, thank you so much for that, Sarah. Um, it's interesting because I've been talking to a lot of people recently about systems thinking and um, it's uh, such a powerful concept uh, that I think we can learn a lot from. So if we have time, I'd love to uh, discuss that more with you. Um, thank you, anyway, uh, next up is J.R. Hammond. 
Uh, so JR is the Executive Director of the Canadian Advanced Air Mobility Consortium, this CAM. The consortium is a not-for-profit on a mission to design and implement a nationwide advanced air mobility strategy. JR is also the CEO and founder of the Canadian Air Mobility, which is a for-profit company advancing activist-based investments in environmental and social ventures within the Canadian advanced air mobility ecosystem. I will turn it over to JR to explain more and how his work fits into this topic of economic transformation. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, James, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to the Vancouver Economic Commission team for hosting us digitally here today my location on the unceded ancestral territory of the Musqueam people. So as mentioned, my name is J.R. Hammond, and I'm privileged to serve as the executive director for CAM, which is our federal, not-for-profit, Canadian Advanced Mobility Consortium. Now, we're really lucky to have our roots and foundation based here in Vancouver, which ties directly to our responsibility and duty for being the voice for the future of sustainable aviation in Canada with advanced air mobility. Our work at CAM focuses specifically on the advancing mobility industry, which brings new, innovative passenger and cargo electric aircraft to Canada. These new aircraft have the ability to take off and land vertically, think like your conventional helicopter, but also transition to horizontal flight, similar to your commercial aviation industry, as seen by your WestJet and Air Canada planes. Now, advanced air mobility is this new industry globally that is moving people, cargo, and performing air services within urban and regional areas that were either previously not served or underserved by aviation, all with electric powered aircraft. Now, while the drone industry focuses on smaller remotely piloted aircraft, our work at CAM brings battery and hydrogen fuel cell planes with the ability to fly larger amounts of cargo up to two hours in duration with six passengers and a pilot on board utilizing today's technology. This is similar to a flight between YVR Airport in Vancouver, that of Kelowna or in Seattle with proper safety reserves for the energy requirements. Now, what do these aircraft actually look like and where are they flying in the world? Well, CAM is working with world renowned car manufacturer Hyundai who have developed their eVTOL, or the electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft for use here in Canada. Other areas such as Dubai, Singapore, regions of Florida and the city of Los Angeles are progressing towards these eVTOL operations as early as 2024. Now this is not exactly the modern day version of the flying vehicle cartoon, the Jetsons, however, very similar. Now in Canada, and specifically in the Metro Vancouver area, these aircraft are to, intended to be used in three main areas. Number one, on the performing of air services. Think of how we can move emergency first responders to the scene of an accident quicker and more efficiently with an electric aircraft. Secondly, on the cargo aspect. How can we move critical, time-sensitive medical materials such as vaccines, blood, organs or cancer fighting isotopes across our urban and critically to our remote re regions of the province with an air solution rather than a conventional ground solution. And lastly, on the movement of people. How can we move more people from point to point with electric aviation that doesn't require additional ground infrastructure of tunnels, bridges, or continued roadway expansion? Now we at CAM know this advanced air mobility industry is developing rapidly and quickly already around the world and beginning here in Canada. Our fundamental mission is to be the catalyst for bringing thought leadership in order to ensure the equitable, inclusive and sustainable development of our resources for the future. With that, we look to the incredible work and leaning into opportunities with the city of Vancouver's Climate Emergency Action Plan on understanding the decarbonization of transportation and the mix for development of our 15 minute city. And similar to the Moving in a Livable Region Partnership led by the incredible Shauna Sylvester and Jude Krasta, how do we find air mobility as an intermodality mix in conjunction with our existing public transportation of the future? This all combined with the privacy and security aspects. 
we know that the future of our air solutions cannot take away our beautiful blue skies of British Columbia and Vancouver, nor can this technology be a congestion shift from ground traffic to that of the sky. Pam is here to explore these difficult questions today. Pam is here to make a difference. And with that, we'll transition back to our question and answer side. Fantastic, thank you so much. Everyone's being uh, very disciplined on the time, it's perfect. Uh, but you know, one of the great things about working at the VEC is we get to meet really fascinating people from all over the world. And also more importantly for our perceptions to be challenged. And I remember uh, the first connection with JR, you have a certain perception where you hear about this. And I know we're gonna dive into this a little bit more later on. But it's really important, I think, for us to listen to others and actually you know, maybe challenge our own preconceived ideas on what this thing will be or that technology. Anyway, thank you so much, JR. Finally, I'm honored to introduce Vancouver Mayor Stewart. Since his election in October 2018, Vancouver Mayor Stewart has prioritized building partnerships to deliver the, the housing that Vancouver needs, tackle the overdose crisis, and invest in transit to build sustainable and walkable communities. His career in public service includes being a member of parliament from 2011 through 2018. He holds a PhD from the London School of Economics and has written and taught on public policy citizenship particip participation, democratic reform, and municipal governance. Mayor Stewart, please share with us your thoughts on the topic of economic transformation. And if there's time, perhaps any reflections, any quick reflections you've heard um, so far. Thank you so much, everybody. And I'll uh, apologize in advance. I have a very active puppy in the background. So if you hear some barking of, uh, it's, it's just a cheerleader that, uh, <laughs> that I brought in to, uh, to help our event here. I uh, just want to thank uh, everyone who's participating, as well as the uh, organizers, of course. Um, want to acknowledge that we are on, I'm on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slave Tooth people, and thank them for their generosity to all who live, work, and play in the city of Vancouver. Um, there are three things I want to highlight in my, in my time here, about five minutes. Uh, housing, as mentioned, uh, reconciliation and uh, transportation connections or uh, any kind of connection really. Uh, but first, uh, I just wanna talk about um, a mindset that I think we have to adopt here in the city uh, is that Vancouver is a global city. And I think it's an important thing to say, although we, we kind of talk about our place in the world, uh, you know, when it comes to things like Olympics and other, other events, uh, really, I don't think it's something that's uh, in our fiber as to say something, uh, you know, if you're a, um, a resident of London or New York or, or even Toronto, uh, who firmly think themselves as, as global cities, sometimes I think we've got one foot in, one foot out here in Vancouver. Um, but we are. Uh, just for an example, uh, Vancouver is a, is a member of C40, uh, which my uh, predecessor, Gregor Robertson, uh, had the great foresight to, uh, to get us into as an innovator city. So where we're not the same population size as, as the other cities I mentioned or other mega cities, uh, we're an innovator city. And, and I think that is, is so important because th there's really two types of global cities. Uh, the first is the city that I want us to become which is a globalist city, is that the things we do here impact the world. It's, uh, we are innovating by cooperating uh, among ourselves, but then we have such an impact that uh, other people around the world are watching what we're doing. And I, and I think we already do that in some ways, whether it's uh, on climate uh, change policy, uh, reconciliation, um, or uh, how we deal with, uh, with drug usage here, uh, and lots of others. But, the second type of city is uh, a globalized city. And that is a, uh, a, a city that's uh, of course in the world, but really the world sets the agenda of the city, whether that's through uh, the movement of capital or, um, or, or other, uh, other means that to kind of set our agenda. So we, uh, and then this panel is very distinguished and has some great ideas. And I think that what we do here in Vancouver, because we're a little smaller than uh, many of the other global cities, uh, we're quite flexible and, uh, and nimble, so we can innovate. And that's very important and I think ties into the, the theme here. Um, so I'll go into my uh, the three issues that I just wanted to bring up. Um, the first thing is, is housing for our workforce. Uh, we really have to get serious about uh, how people are, are living in the city and uh, I would say not affording to do so. 
this has an impact on everything from mental health to productivity to uh, the ability to, to grow our economy and innovate. Um, it also will have some impacts on climate change. And so we really need to make sure, and this ties into the 15 minute city idea, that um, we, make, we gotta make sure that people who, uh, who work here can also live here. Uh, one example is uh, many of our first responders uh, uh, live outside of the city, which is with as few as 10% living within our boundaries, which is not great if you have earthquakes and, and other disasters. So we wanna make sure that, that people can also raise their families here and not just visit for a part of their life and then move, move elsewhere. We, we need to make sure that we're building the type of housing that builds complete communities and not just from um, uh, an economic perspective, but also from a, a multicultural uh, aspect is that we are, our communities are mixed in all possible ways. And I think that is one way we can lead the world uh, by doing that. Uh, we are doing that by innovating, uh, recognizing that we're mostly a, a market economy here when it comes to housing, about 95% of our housing stock is privately owned, but uh, that is working with um, both international and local uh, uh, financiers to make sure that we are building housing for our workforce and we've done that through programs like our moderate income housing pilot program. Uh, I think another way we can be globalist is um, is through reconciliation and every council meeting uh, we do in a land acknowledgement at, at the beginning of the meeting and that's I think a very important first step but then I think what the city has to do is actually change the way we use land to, to match uh, our goal, uh, reconciliation goals. So first it's important to remember that uh, the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh are the uh, combined or the biggest landholders in the city. So they're already an important player in that sense. But, uh, but also there is the uh, obligations that we have to non-host nations uh, that are important to consider as we all try to figure out together what reconciliation not only means in theory, but, but is lands in practice in our city. Um, so really we are shaping the future together uh, step by step. So I, I give an example of Sanok, the uh, Squamish proposal for lands by the Burrard Street Bridge, uh, where of course I've given my full support to, and, uh, and also trying to uh, work with, with uh, council and all members involved to make this uh, a roaring success of what I think will be a, a landmark of, of how reconciliation moves forward in practice. Musqueam also have lands. Uh, we talk uh, very often, uh, the very highest priority in my office is to have uh, monthly meetings with uh, the leadership of the three host nations to, to understand where we can uh, help facilitate their goals and try to work in partnership as closely as possible. So um, I guess my last job, and I learned this in Ottawa, is that people in the rest of Canada don't really get what it means to live on land that is not, uh, does not have treaties, uh, essentially stolen land. And what that means, in, it, it changes the entire dynamic of, of how we do things together. And uh, so I will continue to be a, an advocate and educator in Ottawa, essentially, when it comes to how we work that all out. Um, uh, the last thing I'll talk about is connectivity, uh, which is so important for, uh, um, for our, our economic growth uh, beyond GDP, from what I'm hearing, uh, but also in innovation. So we have, for example, the Broadway subway, which is underway, but I don't see this will be truly finished until it makes it all the way to UBC. Uh, and this does a whole bunch of things. It, uh, it will increase our productivity and, and uh, economic growth along uh, the busiest transit corridor in Canada but it also unlocks reconciliation um, opportunities with the uh, Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh owned land in Jericho. So um, uh, also generating local jobs uh, in neighborhoods that essentially in many cases have hollowed out and need to be uh, slightly reimagined. So um, this will connect one of the world's best research university to hospitals, job centers and the rest of the region. But what I'd really like to see and what we've talked about uh, prior to the pandemic is uh, connecting um, Cascadia is to work on this idea of a high speed rail line that would uh, that would connect uh, UBC and the downtown to Seattle, Portland and LA via, via high speed rail. So if we're thinking about um, 2075, this is what we could think about a 
researcher starts the day at UBC, uh, takes the train to Seattle or LA to pitch the next uh, billion dollar idea, and then returns home uh, to their affordable housing to uh, have dinner with their family. And I think um, this is all possible. Uh, and I don't think 50 years from now, I think we can get to this sooner, especially when it comes to uh, of housing affordability here in the city reconcil and re reconciliation and, and other connections. So uh, I'll stop there, but uh, I wanna thank you so much. In terms of what I've heard, um, I like what I'm hearing. I, I think I've already had my uh, different synapses in my head were kind of firing as I listened to the various presentations of this distinguished panel. I, I will certainly, uh, read the report uh, that was uh, uh, given about alternatives to GDP. Uh, I do think that how we measure things really matter and uh, incorporating other values are, uh, you know, critical in, in guiding policy. Uh, the, um, so I'm, I'm interested in, in, to, uh, in hearing uh, questions from the audience and, and look forward to uh, hearing the, more from, from the panelists. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, Back to the moderator. Thank you, Mayor Stewart. Um, so let's get everyone else's synapses firing with some really uh, good questions. Um, uh, some of these have come from you, the audience. So thank you so much for the people who submitted those. Uh, we've tried to group some questions together and prioritize ones that work for more than one panelist. And if you haven't submitted a question, but would like to, please submit your questions to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your browser, but keep them short and sweet. And I can see there's some fantastic questions coming in already. So thanks for that, keep it up. We'll try and get through as many as we can. Okay, so first question uh, to Chief TG. Um, what does economic reconciliation mean to you? What will true economic reconciliation look like in practice? How will it positively impact our future? Well, I think economic reconciliation is a recognition that First Nations have uh, rights to re resources. Uh, you know, my background is forestry and much of what Canada and British Columbia's economy is based on is in natural resources. So, uh, you know, justice, equality and fairness and access to those natural resources is re required for Indigenous uh, people to prosper. And, and these things are have been uh, in many respects been been uh, argued over uh, fighting over whether it's in the uh, on the land as in roadblocks or in the court system uh, and it has been proven as uh, uh, oh, really that we do have rights to these natural resources so uh, whether it's a, the Chilcot and court case that acknowledged title uh, or if it's, uh, you know, really uh, making arrangements through, through modern treaties or comprehensive reconciliation agreements. So I think in terms of really being practical and, and, and changing into uh, dollars and cents. So, so I think for Indigenous people such as Vancouver, the Musqueam, Squamish and Sabertooth who don't have a treaty and who don't have a, a real arrangement with uh, the province of BC, it, it really opens to uh, First Nations in, in Vancouver to have that uh, ability to, to make those arrangements with the, the federal government, the provincial government and, and even perhaps the municipal government. To, to create those arrangements to, so they can be a productive and, and perhaps really assert their own ways, views and ability to, to have a, really a, a sovereignty and self-determination in the economy. And, and that's the real purpose of, of, of reconciliation and, and perhaps even the really uh, enacting the, the United Nations Declaration. So it, that's essentially it is is a recognition of, of equality and justice for indigenous peoples in this uh, province. With that, Mark, would you have anything to add to that? I agree completely. I think as we start to move towards UNDRIP, which is uh, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, that is going to be a transformational point for this province. It's 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 evident that BC is leading in this. The federal government is modeling a lot of their progress right, on UNDRIP that's happening in British Columbia. And I think Terry Chigi is right, is that Chief Terry Chigi is right, is that as we go forward, it will be the driver for how we reimagine our societies going forward of fairness and inclusion of socioeconomic uh, development, even, even how we develop the province. 
Thank you. And Mayor Stewart, um, would you have anything to add as, as Vancouver is a city of reconciliation already? I think that um, we're, we understand how to uh, interact with um, and to work with host nations. I think our biggest challenge is uh, the urban Aboriginal community, which uh, we're trying to work out how, how to uh, how to develop policy reconciliation with that community. Uh, and it is uh, something that we're doing on, on a daily basis. So for example, uh, the three host nations have a, uh, a referral process where we can uh, put proposals for, um, you know, uh, for, for change or for policy. Uh, however, it's much harder to do with um, uh, people, urban Aboriginals that are living in the city. And so we're, we're struggling and would like some advice as to as to how we might be able to better accomplish uh, working together. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so Mark, if I can move on. So you've written a paper on the topic of well-being and yes. how BC could incorporate the concept of a, as a way of moving beyond GDP to measure our economy. Um, you've outlined this a little bit earlier, but could you, you know, explain more about what's the problem with measuring our economy by GDP um, and how can we move past it? The challenge in using GDP as a measurement tool is you get what you measure. GDP is based primarily on the consumption of stuff and the production of stuff. And there are some, uh, there's some problems with that. For example, uh, it doesn't measure things like, like cultural values. It doesn't measure things that are not paid for with cash. So volunteerism uh -uh, hurts GDP. If somebody decides to go out fishing or grow their own farm food or, or, or are resilient in that sense, it doesn't matter if you're indigenous or not, you're actually hurting GDP because no cash was exchanged for that fish or those carrots. So we get this weird situation where we, we may value culture, we may value our family relations, we may value volunteerism. That's negative, that's a negative to the economy. So our entire system is built on pushing consumption, pushing these values. And we, we, we're challenging that. We're saying, no, if you look at the values that Indigenous people hold in this province and in the city of Vancouver, um, there's more to a good life than just merely stuff. And actually, I'd add to that too. When we did the paper, we did look at other jurisdictions, New Zealand primarily, who's fascinating. They have taken an approach of a multi-generational approach to what is a good life. So in their value system now, besides economics, because we need the economics, mental health, indigenous aspirations, healthy environment. These are multi-generational targets that they're starting to go towards because they've realized you get what you measure. So that's where they're going. And that's where we should go to. And that's actually a follow-up question for me really is, you know, how can we make this happen? Because countries and groups have, have tried to, to move this forward, um, France, the OECD, but did they ever really stick? So you have seen examples of countries that are actually bringing this into practice. We did look, and there's a, 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 something called the Wellbeing Alliance. And uh, the leaders of that are the, they, they call themselves the Sin Nations, which is Scotland, Iceland, and New Zealand. Uh, they are trying to pursue it. And they are putting those in place where they're doing the metrics to say, this is how we define success by our terms, our own values. The interesting thing about that is they end up with a growth plan that is based on the values of the residents of that location. So they're unique to each of the places, but there are examples of people doing it worldwide. The other thing that is in the report we found when we were comparing economies, BC's economy, which I mentioned $309 billion last year, is about the 50th largest in the world. We're just ahead of Greece and New Zealand. So if countries like New Zealand can do this with smaller economies than we are, with very similar values, why can't we do that? Mm. It was interesting that Mayor Stewart's comments on Vancouver has this potential to be a sort of a globalist city and it's often about mindset. Um, I know Sarah, you, you talk a lot about the entrepreneurial mindset as well. I wonder if we can sort of talk about the, the importance of, of, of the startups that are coming out of our BC universities, such as Abcelera and D-Wave, or from graduates such as Stuart Butterfield, who founded Flickr and Slack. What, what do you think the role of, of entrepreneurship and an entrepreneurial mindset will be in creating Vancouver BC's future? Um, are there some great innovations that you know about now that you think is going to be important to our future? I think that's an excellent question and I'm really glad that you teased apart the entrepreneurial mindset with the startups because one leads to the other, but they're not the same thing. And they often get condensed into this idea that if we have startups, they're necessarily healthy startups and they're necessarily gonna grow. 
And what we've actually seen with some of the research done by uh, organizations like Rocket Builders has been that at least in BC, our companies are seeing poorer and poorer, poorer product market fit. And it's because we're, we're looking at the success of a company by how cool their technology is and not what need are you satisfying? What need are you matching it to, right? So there's this idea that good technology and starting companies is going to equal entrepreneurial growth, entrepreneurial progress, and that economic growth that comes with it. Um, but if we don't untie those and go, okay, well, first you need people who actually have an entrepreneurial mindset. Because in Canada, we actually rate really poorly compared to compared to nations on innovation. We're doing, I forget what it comes, but on a letter grade, we would not be impressed with ourselves. Um, but innovation is the precursor to innovation being matching something new to a need it is the precursor to a healthy company. And yet if we don't invest in that early stage where we are exploring and we are figuring out where could this go and imagining not just the most clear future that's, or the, the most, this is the fastest thing I can get to market, but the most impactful thing that we can do. That's when you get the kind of company that like an Upsellera is gonna be an overnight success that took you know, a decade or more to do. Um, we have these amazing scientists um, in BC and in Canada, and yet we don't give them that mindset that's necessary to grow those incredible companies most of the time, right? We happen to be lucky enough to have this magic combination within a group of people. But like I said at the beginning, these are all, all of these components like resilience, imagination, et cetera, are things we have inherent as humans, but we don't spend time building them, unlocking them, et cetera, which is why we're not getting those company, as, as many companies as we could if we spent time unlocking those. And then if you have those companies, then you need scientists who can work in them and understand what keeps the CEO up at night. And you need more of those coming down the pipeline. So you need scientists that are looking at how they translate what they're doing into impact, into, into long-term growth, how they can deploy it for challenges that we have. And so we really need to be investing in that human capacity and realize that that's how you're going to long-term get those uh, companies. And those companies can be, you know, I'm going to talk specifically about science-based companies, but the great thing about science-based companies is they want to be by the UBCs and the SFUs because that's where all the awesome ideas are coming from. And so if you invest there, you get the technical term being stickiness. Um, of geography, where more and more people want to come there and help you grow and help you solve those problems. And so there's significant long term impact that comes for that. But if you have visionary leaders that are willing to invest on that time frame. Well, thank you for that, Sarah. And, and speaking of visionary leaders, JR, perhaps if I could pass over your thoughts for, on the entrepreneurial mindset, because you know, in effect, what you're trying to do is overhaul the aviation industry, which must be pretty difficult. So could you just speak to who this, the kind of people you're working uh, with and what kind of mindset do you need to, to, to take, take on the work that you're doing? Well, no, and that's just taking from the macro perspective there, James, and really bring it to an industry specific one. The global pandemic has absolutely rocked the aviation industry to its core. And this has really created a unique synergy for this great awakening or bridging new skies with a technology such as electric aviation. And it comes down to you know, some key ingredients that are already here in British Columbia and specifically in Vancouver. Number one, on the sustainability side. Having the clean DC from the provincial government, as well as the climate emergency response here in Vancouver, there is a framework that's specific to the ground infrastructure and transportation that we are building into that sky key. Secondly, on the geography side, how are we leveraging existing operations of our helicopter and local uh, float plane providers on moving the people, goods and services over water and connecting that Cascadia Innovation Corridor that uh, Mayor Kennedy spoke of um, between Vancouver, Seattle and Portland, and as well of our operations fees. Look no further than YVR on their 2021 strategic plan, knowing that the climate is at the top piece of that new strategic plan and also on TransLink's Transport 2050 goals. How are we really focusing on that inclusive, equitable and resourceful next transportation mix 
that gives us the opportunity to start stacking new technologies on accomplishing those goals. Thank you. And, and Chief TG and Mark, I wonder if you could comment on the, the importance of First Nation entrepreneurs. And it makes me think of a question probably back to Sarah afterwards is who becomes an entrepreneur, right? Because there's a real challenge in it's a certain person that is able to get on that uh, train and, and head down to LA and, and raise that kind of money. So Chief TG and Mark, would you want to talk on, on that topic of First Nations entrepreneurship? Well, I think in terms of entrepreneurship, like anything else in this country and, and, and this world is that it's very exclusive and and for Indigenous peoples just to, to get into some of the marketplace, it's it's a, it's a huge challenge. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's um, you know, the whole, the, the issue with Vancouver is that, uh, if I could be quite frank, is that it's very exclusive. It's exclusionary. It's, it's a place for the rich. On one hand, you, you have the, the poorest um, zip code, or if you will, postal code in the downtown east side. And, and 20 minutes later, you have the British properties and, and probably the most expensive uh, real estate in the world, if not, you know, at least Canada. So, you know, this dichotomy really is um, exclusionary for, for not only the poor, but uh, also Indigenous peoples. And, and noting that there's a huge uh, uh, Indigenous uh, uh, group within the uh, downtown east side. So, so there's definitely challenges there. And, and that's a challenge with, with, uh, with Vancouver itself, is that being a global city, it's, it's the, the marketplace and also the real estate is being driven up. So it excludes a lot of indigenous peoples and a lot of the poor people. So, so that's, that's really a product of, of what's wrong with the, the world right now is that gap between the rich and the poor is widening and getting wider and wider. And we've definitely seen that in this pandemic. And, and really that's the problem here with, with the world. Mm -hmm. and, and it has a real dire consequences because as we see uh, people uh, having uh, really uh, an economy that um, that is exclusionary. The, the more people that are poor, especially indigenous people around the world, it has dire consequences because because really people end up dying, and uh, and and that's a really big huge issue. So, so Mayor, thank you for that, Terry. So, Mayor Stewart, let's let's get into inequality. Um, you know. How can we ensure that that Vancouver, that BC in 2075, isn't a city or a province of, of the rich and the poor? Um, I was listening to just Richard Florida yesterday and he said, pretty much after every pandemic, there's been huge inequality and it was bad before, as we know, with the Occupy movement. And, you know, is, is that the way we're going to go with COVID as well? So could you speak to the, uh, the importance of inequality and, and what realistically can a city do about that? Yeah, I mean, I think we can do a lot, um, and I, I completely agree with uh, what what's been uh, what what's been said here. Is that you know this this is what I mean about being globalist or globalized. Is that if we let things continue the way they were, uh, this will be um, you know a Monaco on the west coast of, of North America. It will be a, a a play place for for the rich where they park their yachts once a year and. And so, you know, what I've been digging in doing since 2018 is to try to, uh, I think it all comes back to housing affordability or, uh, you know, it does come with jobs and incomes, but one thing we can tackle here at the city is housing affordability. So, you know, what, one thing is we've, um, you know, for example, tripling our empty homes tax uh, was uh, an innovation here in Vancouver enabled by the provincial government, but then now picked up in Toronto and other cities is that if people are going to park their money here in, in empty homes, at least we take uh, a slice of that and then reinvest it into uh, affordable housing, uh, especially those with the most need. Uh, the, the real, I think uh, now that we have the federal government back at the table uh, and the provincial government uh, back at the table with investment in social housing, um, I think at latest count, we're at a thousand units of, of social housing coming online and, and um, approved and, and shovels in the ground already started. So that that begins to make up the deficit. But uh, we've got a long way to go on that front. Uh, you know, um, I uh, we got to about $50 million in direct investment the last year on this rapid housing initiative. And just to put that in perspective, that that's an equivalent of a 6% property tax hike for us. So um, I, I think we need to be realistic that that kind of that kind of housing that that is really uh, 
heavily subsidized needs to come from senior levels and it needs to come from, from um, you, you know, income tax pools. However, on the city level, uh, what we can do is work with investors. So for example, those who want to build rental housing, we can give more density and we can build things like uh, these Merck projects, which are, we approved one last night, a uh, six story um, rental building in Kitsilano. 20% uh, of the units are, uh, are vacancy controlled. So their rents never increase over the life of the building. Uh, and um, you can get a, you'll have a, a studio apartment for 950 bucks a month. So we are now working with the capital that's coming in here to say, if you wanna build your buildings, we can accelerate the development, uh, the, the, the permissions, we can give you more density, but you have to build in uh, these guaranteed income level units, which is starting to move people into neighborhoods they can never be before. So, so th that's an innovation um, and lots of other cities are starting to look at it now. So, so I mean, for me, it, it's how do we uh, ban the market essentially? Cause I, I don't have enough money to, to build uh, all the housing that we need. I need the federal and provincial governments to do that. Thanks for that. Um, so on, on sort of the topic of, of innovation, I want to come back to, to Mark on this. Um, how does innovation and startup success tie into the needs of First Nations people, and especially in a world where success is not measured by GDP necessarily? Um, you know, the current model of startups, you know, raising venture capital, it's, it's a bit of a problem. And uh, what, is, what is that role of, of First Nations um, and, and startups are, are transforming our economy, in effect? I was just typing an answer to that in the box and you just asked me that. No, there seems to be a misconception here that in a, 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 an economy based on values excludes the economic, excludes the startup, excludes innovation. No, not at all. A well-being economy as being practiced in other places in the 40 examples we looked at worldwide, do not exclude the startup, the innovation. In many ways, in all ways, the economy is still important. We still need an economy. We're not saying get rid of it. What we're saying though, is how we measure success should be changed. So it includes more of the values that are in the people. And I would like to point out that yes, I'm here as an indigenous participant, so as the regional chief, but we are still citizens of British Columbia. We are, I am a citizen of Vancouver. I have a vested interest in the success of our entire community, not just indigenous people. So from the sense of what's going on back to what was earlier is that indigenous people are involved in startups, are involved in innovation. It is difficult, but it is happening. There's programs like at SFU, the BD school has a program, uh, indigenous uh, values MBA program. There is uh, programs at the University of British Columbia that encourage that through the Chinook program. And now Souter is moving into that as well. But the innovation and startups, if they are based on the past economies that we've had, which have been consumption or are carbon intensive, those are a problem. But a society that's moving towards valuing a zero, a zero carbon economy like the aviation industry, or even on smaller scales, that's where success is going to happen. And the innovation we require is about blending our values that we hold dear as a society in relation to the environment, in relation to other people, and the companies in the future will come through that. The discussion I think would be better focused on what values do we want to encourage in our economic planning, in the future that we're laying out, and then how our young people start to move towards being innovators in that space. Fantastic. Sarah, you know I have to jump to you on that one. How should we be measuring uh, our startups, our innovation, our, our entrepreneurs? What, like, what should they be measured on? Right, so this is a really big question and it's probably its own panel, but I'm gonna, gonna give it a shot to at least try because I very much echo what, what Mark was saying. And I realize, uh, forgive me, I talked about and acknowledged what land I was on when we introduced ourselves and I haven't done that publicly. Um, so I think it is really important because it is so important in innovation to have those shared values and also to acknowledge what came before you. So I'm on the Quitlam, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, Stolo and um, Squamish. Uh, unceded territories. Um, so with regard to your question on measuring innovation, one of, the, one of the most important questions we can ask is who can participate? Who have we put up barriers to participate? And what does that mix look like? Because I, I talked earlier about having this problem with product market fit, and that comes with not understanding the people who you're trying to innovate for and having a really you know old school view of I will make a widget, I shall sell a widget. Well, like Mark was saying, I shall make a thing that I can drop on my foot versus I'm here to solve a problem. 
I'm here to solve a problem that's affecting enough people to make a sustainable business. And there's so, and it's so important in that case to be honoring the views of the people you are solving problems for, and also finding ways to look at the world and those problems with new lenses. And so if we look at, okay, well, from a university standpoint, you know, how many people of whichever group are participating in our programs and then going, okay, so why not? Um, are you, are you making people feel unwelcome? We recently, we recently started a, an EDI stream within our um, Entrepreneurship Institute. And one of the first questions that was posed was what's stopping people from chasing their entrepreneurial dreams? And, you know, we have this vision of the entrepreneur who, you know, lives in their parents' basement, only lives on ramen and like uh, mortgages their house or uh, sells their car. But even those things suggest that you had you had the car to start with. You had the parents who can afford to keep you in the basement. Um, you had you have all of these things. Um, but if you look at entrepreneurial mindset, it's often the community behind you um, and the experiences you get given early on that build that character and build that idea. When we were, we we're talking about our um, our young entrepreneurs yesterday, and they often said, you know, they were they don't have the experience of being told. Um, you can't do it, I'm gonna, but I'm gonna push through anyway. They said they've had the exact opposite. They've been told, they've been told, I can't, they've told themselves, I can't do it. And then they come into community that tells you, actually you can, and we're going to help you. And we're going to be able to figure out how to make this place where you feel like you can do important things. And that starts really, really early. So measuring those, like who is participating, who is getting access to the right education, who is getting access to those resources, it's gonna be critically important and it's not gonna come when we're measuring, just measuring things like how much venture capital did you raise? Did you get acquired for how much? Thank you, Sarah. Um, JR, I mean, in effect, it makes me think you're, you're building a platform, a brand new platform, but from the outset, you've identified, you know, it needs to be uh, inclusive and needs to be equitable. So how do you build this new platform and what are your measurements of this platform uh, regarding all the things we've just sort of discussed in the last hour? Well, and this brings that, that entrepreneurial mindset in. So it's not only leveraging the existing champions or having success in not only their community engagement, their vision of the future in terms of the triple bottom line of that economic, environmental, and social inclusion. This is coming from YVR, TransLink, Harbor Air, and Helijet. But the spotlight I really wanted to bring upon is our partnership with Esquail Air, the world's first indigenous woman-run airline by Tierra Fraser, based here in Vancouver. This synergy that Tierra is unlocking with Esquail Air is really that build bridges aspect between not only the indigenous wisdom, but the sustainable aviation narrative of the future and the insight and conversations being developed of how this new technology could be aligned with existing community needs and values. This is giving us a great an entrepreneurial base to build upon. Well, that's, um, I mean, that's super interesting, I think, for everyone to hear about. Uh, and I can see Mark not in, jotting down some notes, maybe to, to follow up on that one. I hope that that is a positive a model, an example of what economic reconciliation uh, can mean in practice, going back to almost my first question, um, it, how it ties in so many of the different things we've talked about, which is, you know, who's becoming an entrepreneur, who's who's getting to run that business, who has a say in that, uh, how do we uh, reconcile with, you know, who owns the land. Um, Chief TG, I know we're kind of running out of time, but I know I haven't had given you a chance to speak perhaps as, as much as others. Is, is there something you'd like to add to that? Um, any, any sort of sort of concluding thoughts as, as it were? Well, in terms of reconciliation and, and in terms of all the discussions, there's definitely room for innovation for Indigenous peoples, especially now that we're moving towards a, a low, um, you know, carbon economy. And for First Nations, you know, there's this discussions we're always utilized as an impetus for, for fighting pipelines and, and high carbon projects. But we're not going to get there overnight. There needs to be a plan as we transition from this uh, carbon-based economy to a low-carbon-based economy. So First Nations can be a part of that catalyst. They can be catalyst and, and to those change. And like uh, Tara Fraser and, and her uh, 
uh, you know, her innovation and and, and her taking the, her rightful place in that space as a, uh, you know, to to develop her uh, view of of the economy within the airspace realm, she had to fight for that, not only as a woman but as an indigenous woman. So, uh, two things that were going against her, and yet she's still here. And I think that's really a lesson learned to to all Indigenous peoples that uh, with the levels of, of different governments, uh, federal, provincial, or, or municipal, we have to fight for for not only a right to take our, our, our space and our, our governance and the recognition of our ability to make decisions, but also for, for land. And, and perhaps, you know, that's some of the things that, that um, you know, Mushkaroom, Squamish, and Sarah are doing uh, with the, the, the development near the Burrard Bridge, you know, the, the areas, you know, that involves the, the federal and provincial government as well, where, you know, perhaps, you know, the, this is a discussion that um, many Indigenous people are having, you know, additions to reserves, more areas so our people can uh, come home. You know, a lot of our people, we say, are away from home. Uh, 75 to 80 percent of our Indigenous people live off reserve in urban centres, including Vancouver, Prince George, Kelowna, Kamloops, are in those areas. They, they live away from home. And, and that's a really important piece as a part of our economy is bringing back our people so we can have a, an economy within our communities. This has been brought up. I'm also the, the, the chair for the Chiefs Committee on Economic Development. That was one of the biggest issues that, that we talked about from all regions in Canada. Um, other things that we're talking about too is our really our rightful place to trade amongst ourselves and trade with our Indigenous peoples in the United States and also New Zealand. So creating Indigenous trade zones. You know, there's there's many innovate, innovation, innovative ways, I should say, to, to really um, deal with some of these these economic uh, issues. And and as our national chief said, you know, his one of his big mandates or or you know really the platform was on was to you know really try, you know close the gap between uh, you know uh, citizens of Canada and indigenous peoples here in Canada is to close that gap. Absolutely essential to do that. Um, I'm so sorry we're running out of time and I apologise to all the people who've been sending in um, such fantastic questions. We're going to have to do it again because these questions have to be asked. Um, just really quickly, sort of lightning quick round now, if I can ask everyone, I want to end on a positive note, what makes you excited for the future? So if you could just do sort of 30 seconds, um, I'll start with Mark. 30 seconds. What's great about the dialogue, this panel, What's going on in the province and what's going on across uh, Indigenous, non-Indigenous, immigrants, everybody, there's a dialogue. And the COVID, as tragic as it's been, has been a positive as we focused on what it means to be whole as a people, a people united. Thank you. Sarah? I would like to echo Mark. I think we have an amazing moment. Um, when, we, when you have that ah moment, that's also often where you get opportunities. And so I think we have a time now where we, people are willing to think past status quo and that's exciting. But what I would really like to see happen um, is make sure that we're investing very, very early in the, that mindset for as far as like elementary school and kindergarten where very early we unleash all those amazing things, and the things within and then keep it going with a community so that we can get all these changes that we see in the future. Thanks so much, Sarah. JR, what makes you excited? I'm just going to bring it to the aspect of what our mindset can be when we stop thinking in just a two-dimensional space and start including the 3D space above us. How does that change how our cities look, our region, and how we connect people, goods, and services? And having that conversation from day one, knowing that we are at a synergy of upshifting the, the aviation industry with coming out of the pandemic aspect. Thank you. Ms. Stewart? Yeah, uh, well, thanks uh, everybody for your thoughts today. I mean, what excites me about uh, the future is, is Vancouver. Um, you know, as acknowledged, there are a ton of housing pressure here and the inequity is obvious, but in some ways it, it's it's not a bad problem to have. The, the worst problem is when, you're, when your community is, is hollowing out, when folks are leaving. Uh, being a former Maritimer, I, I left because unemployment rate was 20%. So I think it's really uh, making sure we, we take advantage of the opportunities and to make sure they're equitable. 
Uh, so what we're finding through uh, some of our social housing audits and is that they're, they're not equitably distributed. And I think that uh, speaks to the regional chief's point of view about, about how we uh, include people and that's the challenge ahead. So how do we, you know, we, we've got lots of interest here in the city. Uh, how do we harness it so it's equitably distributed and, and reconciliation has to be at the heart of that. Thanks so much. And Chief TG, uh, would you like to conclude? Yes. Uh, you know, we're living in a time of change, the age of reconciliation. And then also now there's legal precedence in terms of the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It's law now in British Columbia, and potentially this will be law in Canada as one of the first countries in Western society to adopt it as law. And now for the first time, we have not only our human rights recognized, but also our Indigenous rights recognized. And, and this really will be a, a, a time for change for Indigenous peoples for the better. And I, and I see in the next five, 10 years that perhaps this is the most significant and substantial change we'll see in, uh, for Indigenous peoples in this country. Thank you. Thank you so much. So a huge thank you to all of our very busy, very in-demand panelists for giving us their time and expertise today. And we've covered a lot of ground and hopefully it was new ground for, for the audience and you've learned something interesting. Um, I think what I heard clearly today is there are massive changes already underway that are affecting our lives. Um, and yet we need all of society to contribute towards that, to generate the data, to work on the policies, the startups, uh, and generate the ideas that will help us steer, help steer us towards the, the version of the future that we all want to see. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, it's for these reasons we are launching the Economic Transformation Lab today, along with our partners and co-hosts SFU. Uh, some of you might have seen our affordability guide, which is already up there, and if not, I recommend you check it out. Um, and here's the link uh, on the screen. Um, you'll also be able to learn about all the other projects I mentioned, along with how you can get involved and how you can submit our next research idea. So with that very cheeky plug, um, I hope you've enjoyed today's webinar. Special thank you to the team at SFU, especially Dana and Edna, for running the whole show today. We couldn't have done it without you. Thanks again for listening and for your time. And please be sure to follow us on social for more uh, events and news of this kind. Um, and as I said, I think we're going to have to turn this into series because the questions are really stellar. So thank you so much for those. I'm going to leave you all with a quote I heard just last week from Carol Ann Hilton, who's the founder of the Indigenomics Institute. The questions we ask today are the architecture of our future. Goodbye and see you in the future.